The baby you see to the house, what to pay the feet of your game. You made him a poacher yourself, squire, you give not a work the meat. And your folly bed has up the garden at the dust of the children's feet. We lay in a burning fever on the mud of the cold clay floor. Till you parted us all for months, squire, at the cursed workhouse door. There's blood on your new foreign shrubs, squire, there's blood on your pointer's feet. There's blood on the game you sell, squire, there's blood on the game you eat. You've sold the labour in man, squire, body and soul to shame. To pay for your seat in the house, squire, to pay the feet of your game. I don't think landowners really care about the countryside. They only care about it so long as it's profitable. If it ceased to become profitable, they'd, they would lose all interest in it. I've never made any money out of it, but uh, it means more to me, I'm sure, than those who make vast sums of money from it. They ex extract anything and everything that can be turned into money. That's why you've got no banks and hedges, and why trees are being cut down everywhere, and the landscape is being turned into a, into a desert, really. Just a barren space with nothing because they want more and more. I think landowners, big landowners can do just as they like because the majority of them decide, they decide where things are going to go anyhow and they do it to their advantage. And poaching goes back to your landowners. It's the landowners who control the countryside, the big landowners. They decide what's going to be and what's not going to be. Nobody else. They make the laws. Well, because until you fence a piece of land off and say it belongs to me, when you've done that, then you get poachers. Well, again, I think the poacher um, certainly has been going as long as civilization has been going. And in the early historical times, when all the forests belonged to the king, anybody who poached without a royal, anybody who chased game without a royal warrant was, of course, a poacher. Um, as game rearing and shooting became more intensive, of course, the poacher became more of a felon. And during the 19th century, when shooting, certainly in East Anglia, became perhaps the most popular pastime, the poacher found himself under the greatest pressure. And he, in turn, went poaching partly for sport, but very much during the difficult times and depressions, um, to have something for the pot and to feed his family on. I mean, there were, there were periods during the early 19th century when there was tremendous unemployment. And people simply couldn't, couldn't even get a... They'd get perhaps three days' work in the quarry to feed a wife and five or six children. And obviously there was a lot of resentment. Um, and people were very, very hard pushed to make ends meet, and they, they poached to feed their families, literally. Historically, game laws were very, very severe indeed, dating from the time when the, all the forests belonged to the king. And um, you can see by this man trap here, which was in use up until the early part of the 19th century, this is the sort of um, horrific weapon that was used against the poacher until they were outlawed, um, I think in the third decade of the 19th century. But deportation, death, was a common occurrence in the 19th and 18th century, early parts, for poaching fences. Well, as you see, the programme is in full swing now. We rear somewhere in the region of 3,500 birds here. 800 of those are partridges, and the rest are pheasants. During the rearing programme, we lose a few buds. Some of the reason are 10% pheasant, about 3% partridge. And I think that is general. The birds stay on the rearing field for six weeks, and after then we take them to the release pens, which are darted about in various woods. Then we have to really keep an eye on them then for the sake of the poachers having to look around and, and 
wound out where they are. Well, we can't afford to lose any birds because, uh, I mean, what were the, uh, the cost on course around about ten pound a bird by the time they are shot, and we hope to kill around about a couple of thousand a year. So, I mean, therefore you understand the the overall cost. harvest when the combines come out and uh, the corn starts getting cut then one can see just how the pheasant population and partridges are looking for the oncoming season. And of course the gamekeeper does the same thing so he can weigh up how he's got to have his partridge drives and which way he's got to drive his birds and where his wild stock are. So he's riding around doing the same thing as what you are and it just so happened that riding around on a cycle at harvest time is also a convenient time to start getting your dog fit for the coming season because that needs four or five weeks of trotting beside the boat six or seven miles a day to get it turned up for October when the hair caution starts. Well you start off say about the middle of August about two or three miles a day do that for about two weeks and then for the next two weeks about four or five miles a day and by the time you get uh, to the end of September you're doing six and maybe eight miles a day with the dog and by then it should be fairly fit and ready to go out and do a night's work. In some years you can even be surprised you get a really wet spring and you think oh dear all the young partridges have got to be killed off and drowned by the wet spring and yet you find harvest time you, you can find some really good cubbies still. I think there's a combination of uh, weather and chemicals used on whatever crop they happen to be living in at the time. Well, I think that, that several things have happened. Um, farmers have increased field sizes. There aren't the same natural habitats that there used to be. Uh, certainly in this particular area, it's a very heavy soil, and therefore not the best partridges anyway. Uh, of course, there's the argument of pesticides. Uh, but on the other hand, we're trying to counteract this by putting in broader shelter belts, uh, areas of grassland where there are corners of hedgerows that have come out uh, to increase the natural habitat for the partridge. <laughs> they've got nowadays and needing a lot less labour. I mean, 10 men can do, today can do the work that they've needed 70 men to do um, 50 or 60 years ago. And I suppose with the advanced methods of agriculture and more and more people being made unemployed through it, a lot of the locals did leave the villages for the simple reason that they had to move to the towns to get work. They did create vacant cottages and that, which outsiders have now brought up. But at the same time, those locals would never have been able to afford to buy the cottages anyhow, or very, very few of them. And a lot of cottages, of course, came on the market because the man of the house had died or, or something had happened to him, which made him unable to work anymore for his employer, and so therefore he had to get out, or his wife and family had to get out. Well, they've changed because there's hardly any locals left. Nobody, there's very few people know what country life is about anymore. But they've got, they've got this, this fairy tale image of the countryside, you know, which is all roses and lovely and everything is nice in the country. 
and they don't realise, you know, that nature has, has got the other side as well. It's a hard life, but it is for those that are locals and uh, have had to make a living off the land in the best way they can. From August till September, that's like the never-ending wait, you know, just waiting to be able to go out. And the first night of the season is, is like the first night you ever went out and ever shot a pheasant. That's always the same. Six weeks before the season you start, and you can't help it, you start looking for the cubbies sitting on the fields, the cubbies of foragers, seeing how many pheasants, young pheasants there are about, weighing it all up, ready for October or September in the case of foragers seeing where everything lies. It's like uh, after harvest, it's a new world. There's so much more to be seen and it's all new. Well, I think that stubble burn is unnecessary and, and there's far more wildlife gets killed by burnt stubble burn and than people realise. I've seen uh, dead leverets and rabbits, young rabbits and partridges, game birds and all, all sorts scorched up for, for stubble burner. And of, of course a lot of farmers aren't too bothered about whether that burn the hedges down too. I suppose stubble burning came in when uh, Theory farming stopped. That's when people really started burning the stubble off. When uh, dairy farming in Norfolk uh, started to come to an end. I think uh, we like to kill anything up to 100 to 150 a day. Um, that gives everyone a shot. Uh, there's 10 guns, and uh, we don't like to kill a lot of pheasants uh, because we've got 10 days shooting to get in, so that's killing somewhere around about the 100 mark, just so that kill. We kill about 1,000 a, a, a year. Some places you go to, they might be kill 1,000 a, a day. They don't expect to kill hundreds well, especially with our syndicate anyway, um, they aren't sort of the, the, the cream of the shots, but they all enjoy themselves, and, and that's what uh, the day is about. Uh, whether they kill ten pheasants or whether they kill a thousand, uh, they'd still be happy. Uh, there's a good deal of leg pulling go on uh, on the day. Uh, they're, they're just businessmen that like to go out of the office for a day a week. Uh, they give them a bit of exercise, and, uh, and they have a bit of sport. And uh, provided they want the sport, then I shall keep a job. I think there's no denying that shooting is an extremely expensive sport. Uh, but I think the thing one's got to bear in mind is that all the money raised uh, from letting shooting uh, is recycled into the rural economy. Uh, it's giving employment. Uh, it's giving quite a number of people uh, an enjoyable day out beating. Uh, and they all come and they love it. Uh, and I can produce plenty of people to prove that to you. So that it's not. Uh, quite as straightforward, I think, as saying that it's, it's a rich man's sport. There is a tail end to it uh, that uh, brings benefit to those that live 
uh, and enjoy the countryside. I don't see, unless they're a very, very rich man now, how, how they can afford to um, how, uh, to run a shoot um, with, with big numbers, uh, numbers of presents anyway. Um, I mean, a good shoot now would at least it needs at least 20,000 a year to run it, I take it. Um, and, you know, uh, there ain't that many people with the money to spend 20,000 plus a year. Well, with them saying, uh, you know, it's a challenge. Uh, Bill just now said that he knows a, uh, uh, somebody who's, who's been shooting and he's a hundred percenter, you know, and he gave the shooting up because there's no challenge left. I think that's really what it, what it amounts to. It's a challenge with nature. Same as, same as with farming, this is what country is all about. Well, I think we like a day in the open. Yeah. 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 Watch the dog work. If they get a bird or two now and again, they're very happy. That's they it. don't come out to kill everything. They come out to preserve what they can. If it weren't for the shooting men, there'd be no pheasants, very little, and anything. You notice we've all missed the left low ones, pick, pick the best ones, and we meet a lot of new people. I mean, I've come, this is the first time I've been on the shoot and met a lot of new friends. You know, that's very much a so social gathering, yeah. a social event. There's nothing cruel about it. I mean, I don't see any difference between raising cattle to eat or raising anything to eat or raising these to shoot. I mean, as you have seen, everything that has been wounded have been picked up, so there's nothing left behind. That's in the butcher shop, that's helping the export trade. I mean, virtually every peasant that we kill goes abroad anyway. And uh, that been, this has been going on for years and years and years, and I hope, I don't, I hope that never die out. I ain't going to say that rearing won't die out in time, because I think it will. And when that happens, a lot of the countryside, there won't be a pleasant place. There won't be nothing else, will there? No, there won't. Some of the reason I'll fell the woods, I'll pull those the hedges out. Um, I mean, we don't close. To uh, people who are unaware of the gangs on in the countryside and the tradition of uh, field sports, pheasant shooting, and so on, it may seem strange to equate uh, game conservation with shooting. However, uh, it's very interesting to note that game, of course, is at its most plentiful uh, on the farms uh, and estates where shooting takes place because it is regarded as a crop there uh, in the same way as other crops on the farm. And a proportion of the annual farm budget is put towards maintaining this crop. I think that conservation and shooting um, 
go terribly much together. And I'm not um, necessarily holding a candle for country sports, although I indulge in them myself. But one thing is absolutely certain, that without shooting in Norfolk or, say, hunting in the Midlands, the countryside would not be conserved the way it is. Um, I'm actually keen on the visual landscape, but if I wasn't, I was just keen on farming, and I wasn't interested in shooting, well, I could cut every tree down and have one huge wheat field. Might make a few extra bob. But, I mean, it's, I mean there's no doubt about it that um, country sports have shaped the landscape, particularly in East Anglia, which is entirely a man-made landscape. Obviously, um, the way the land, how heavy or light the land is, has dictated the size of the fields in the past. But nowadays, it's very much the shooting interest, in fact, which is keeping the parts of North which are preserved, preserved as they are. It's man's basic natural instinct to go out and hunt his food. I don't know of any other better feeling, and I think most people would admit the same. Really, if they're, if they're truthful, there is a hunting instinct in all of us. It's just in some of us it's, it lays dormant, and in others it's active. And if that basic natural instinct is within you, then it has to come out. And when the weather is right and everything is right, then you have to go. And you're working with nature. You're working with the weather and, and the crops and everything, and the time of the year, the seasons, everything. Nature de decides whether you go out and you have a good night, or whether you go out and you get nothing. You go out on the, when there's a rime frost, you'll come home empty-handed. But you go out when the wind is blowing, starlit night, no moon, then the chances are you'll have a good night. You never know what's over the other side of the hedge until you get there. And when you get there, you never know what you're going to find. If they're in it, no, well, they are in it for the money. I mean, there's some of these money to be made out of it with pheasants now at three pound a brace. If you can go and get 20 pheasants, I mean, that isn't a bad night's work. Uh, to you're talking to 10 brace of pheasants, well, that's 30 quid. I mean, that's virtually my week's living wages. But that's only partly money. I don't think that determines whether they go out or not. Not money alone. And if it was a case of just going out and earning money, there'd be a hell of a lot of people to that. But there's a lot of times you go out and you don't earn no money. And it's usually the times when you need it most. Well, you keep going, don't you? I mean, you might, you might walk four or five miles and, you know, just not even get an old bird, you know, not even have one shot. And then suddenly you might just drop into a little old pit hole that happened to lie warm and the night can change and suddenly you've got yourself a dozen birds and home you go, quite happy. And not only that, that's that, uh, that all belongs to you, you know. When you're out there, there's nobody else about. There's nobody to tell you where you, where you go and where you can't go. You can go where you like. You ain't got to walk around the road. You can walk straight across the fields. You can go as a crow fly. Even if we own the land, as, as I'm a landowner, I consider myself to be a steward of the land for my lifetime. 
and the poacher quite probably going to take the view that nobody owns the land, God owns the land, and therefore he's going to have his share of it. Now at the valley belt, um, I had a listen down here and I can't hear anything, so um, I'm now going to take that In the season, um, right early on, you, you've got to be out uh, night watching, as we call it. Um, we start off earlier on um, in September uh, for partridges. Um, we try and bush the stubbles up, uh, pieces of barbed wire we'll put out, anything to stop the boys coming with uh, uh, dragon nets. Then we go on to, to uh, the woods and the belts. Um, I generally try and, and um, sit about in the van some nights if it's cold or if it's, if it's very cold, then I'll, I'll get the old dog and, and we'll go out on foot. Um, anything to try and, and be in a different place um, or not be in the same place two nights running. Um, very often they'll come just as soon as the old birds get up. Um, five o'clock uh, tea time when they expect you to be at, uh, having your tea. Um, you can't really put a, a time down. Uh, their wife never knows when I'm coming in for tea, put it like that. Um, and uh, then some of them will wait through and come through one, two o'clock in the morning, might be three, four o'clock in the morning even, um, and they'll be going home when all the early workers are going to work so they aren't noticed. Um, there's just no telling, you've virtually got to do all, all night and half the morning as well. In my career anyway, I, I have been done a time or two, obviously. And um, the next morning when you go through the wood, uh, there's nothing on, nothing will come to the whistle when you whistle your birds up. Um, you get heaps of feathers here, there, and everywhere, and um, you know you really feel sick about it. Um, if I had my way, I should uh, put the blue light in jail, sort of thing, and uh, you know, and, and, and let throw away the key. It usually turns into a personal thing between the local poacher and the gamekeeper. They usually hate each other's guts. The gamekeeper hates the poacher because he can't catch him, and the. Uh, Poacher finish up hating the gamekeeper for his devious deeds he do, he's likely to do, you know. Or he shoot his dog, poison it, snare it. I have seen a, a gamekeeper's gibbet with three whippet type lurchers hanging on it. The carcasses of three whippet type lurchers hanging on it, not far from here, in Norfolk. And what can the poacher do anyhow? Even if he knows the gamekeeper has shot his dog or poisoned his dog, what can he say? He can't say nothing. He can't take the court. That was as simple as that. If you walked on my land, you got your foot in a leg trap, in a man trap, and that was cut off. You didn't come anymore. You knew exactly where you were. You knew if the Lord of the Manor caught you on there and your father worked there, and, your, and you were caught, your father would be out on his ear straight that night.
It's the same as somebody keeping a running dog or a lurcher. It's just not done. If you live in a tied cottage, then you can't keep a lurcher. And I know of people who have been threatened with, threatened with eviction today if they kept a lurcher, which is basically no, no different to the peasants years ago when they had a running dog. And the law stated that the dog had to have its one toe removed from each front foot. Of course, even the poor old farm labourer has got a few more rights to the day than he did have a few years ago. When your home depends on your conduct and the fact that you may or may not be with, with a roof over your head or not, then some people decide it's easier to work from dawn or dusk for somebody who's got far too much anyhow than uh, to pursue their natural instincts. And there's no money got out of poaching anyhow. Real poachers never get rich, not from what they do. I've seen lots of tr people try to turn themselves into poachers, and it's impossible. They can't. They lack that something else that you can't put into words. It's just not there. They're like bulls in a china shop. They don't know how to walk through a wood quietly and never will do. The majority of people who move to villages today, they just put down the poachers' way of life as being wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong because it's illegal. It's wrong because you just shouldn't go out and shoot pheasants or game. You, you, you can't do that, just walk out across the field and shoot a brace of old birds. And they can't understand why you do it. I've seen these people with all this field to the countryside move to these little villages. They come here and they go and live off the land and they get a goat and they put in a few cabbages and a few potatoes and that. And I've seen what they're living off the land is. I've never seen nothing like it, you know. It's pathetic. It really is. They're playing a game, you know, which to people who are born in Norfolk comes naturally. And they're just trying, they're playing at living in the countryside. And you can't, you can't argue with them, they've got all the answers, they know everything. Can't tell them anything, about anything. Because they had, you know, most of them had very good education, and so consequently I suppose that they think, uh, you know, they do know everything. But they don't know about the things that really matter. I don't think so. 